All right, this meeting thing. I'd just like to start by introducing myself. I'm Jane Morton from Extinction Rebellion in Melbourne, and I'm a psychologist who's quit work to work on the Extinction Rebellion. And I'd like to introduce David Spratt, Research Director of Breakthrough Institute for Climate Restoration, and somebody who's devoted a large portion of the last 13 or 14 years, possibly even longer now, to really getting on top of the climate emergency science and helping activists like us to know exactly what the situation is and how to speak about it. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm here on Wurundjeri land, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. David, over to you. Thanks, Jane. Um, there's a PowerPoint, um, inevitably, uh, with these things. Um, Jane has a copy of the PowerPoint as a PDF, which she will send to participants afterwards. So you don't have to take lots of notes and scribble because the PowerPoint will be available. And on the last slide of this presentation is my email address. So people can also email it direct, directly if they want this PowerPoint. So um, I'll talk through the first few slides rather than letting getting you to see them because it gets a bit boring reading what I'm saying. So I thought as a starting point, um, people might have noticed recently there's been a bit of um, verbal biffo between Michael Mann and some people around Extinction Rebellion where Michael Mann, the, the United States um, uh, scientific uh, uh, researcher, has a new book out where he talks about soft, soft doomerism and people who want to talk about collapse as being almost as bad as denialists and some people who kick back and saying, well, it's only reasonable to talk about um, the possibility of collapse because it could be on the agenda. So I just thought I might um, do something which amongst the science also ask the questions, are we heading towards climate driven systems collapse? Is it inevitable? And what do we need to do to stop it being inevitable? Um, so this is partly based on a presentation we did at the end of last year called Climate Reality Check. Some of you may have seen the video of it from, from um, February. So just to start with this question about collapse, I mean, it is, it is now clear that um, the, the present commitments under the Paris Agreement are enough for three to five degrees, three to five degrees of, of warming, unless nations do more than they, they've currently promised. And that is literally an existential risk, risk to human civilization. By existential risk, we mean um, a permanent and drastic curtailing of human civilization's future development. So society just won't go on the way it is. And um, this is not my opinion. Um, the scientists say that three degrees of warming would be catastrophic. Um, US national security analysts more than a decade ago said if we get the three degrees, the world will be characterized in their words by the, the phrase outright chaos. Uh, Professor Kevin Anderson from the UK said if we get to four degrees of warming, that, that it would be, and I quote, incompatible with the maintenance of human civilization. And even the World Bank said it's, it would, would be difficult to adapt to uh, four degrees. So the prospect that we are heading towards uh, civilizational collapse is real, is real. It's not inevitable, but it, it, it is there unless we do a lot more than we have now. And that means we have to think about the risks of climate change differently from the way we think about other risks. I mean, when you think about risk management, they, they build planes. Um, they do the best they can, but if they crash because they've got bad software, they say, oh, bad luck, let's work out what went wrong and we'll replace the software and the plane won't crash again. That's, that's, how, that's how risk management works. But we can't do that with the planet because if we crash the planet, there's not another planet to go back to. So we can't say, oh, look, near enough is good enough and we'll learn from our mistakes because in climate change, we cannot learn from failure. Instead, we have to take a different approach, which is to say, what's the worst thing that could happen? What is the worst thing that could feasibly happen under climate change? And what do we need to do to stop that thing happening? And that is what, um, it's called the precautionary principle. It's, it's, you know, it's the precautionary principle is well known. Do not act to, co to cause harm. When faced with uncertain threats, act as if those threats are real. Um, but that's exactly what we are not doing with climate change. Instead, we have um, a very different mode of thinking about the risks. I mean, for you, any of you who follow um, the IPCC and its carbon budget, you'll see these figures about, oh, this carbon budget's got a 50 or 66% 66, 66 chance of 
not causing disaster. I mean, we don't get on a plane, a lift, or in a lift if there's a 1% chance of failure. Nobody I know would get in a plane if there's a 1% chance of failure. But in climate politics, a one third, a one in three chance of failure is taken as um, normal and reasonable. And so the problem we face is that the body of work which policymakers use for climate, um, um, for considering climate policy is the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, um, known as the IPCC. It's sort of the Bible and unfortunately <laughs> it's not up to scratch. Um, a couple of years ago, we did a report on um, the um, on what we call the scientific reticence or the underestimation of risk by the IPCC, and we were fortunate to, uh, to have a guy called John Schellenhuber, Professor John Schellenhuber, who's the most probably the most eminent climate scientist in Europe, um, advisor to Angela Merkel, advisor to the to the Pope, uh, to write a forward to our report on the IPCC. And I just want to read what he said. He said. And this is the problem we have. He said, and I'll quote, experts tend to establish a peer worldview. Anybody in academia will know this, a peer worldview which becomes ever more rigid and focused. Yet the most crucial insights regarding the issue in question may lurk at the fringes, as this report, our report, uh, suggests. This is particularly true when the issue is the very survival of our civilization, where conventional means of analysis may become useless, unquote. So what Sheldon Hoover is saying here is that the IPC's approach may be useless, may be useless. So let me just share this PowerPoint now, and I'll just show you a little bit about why that's the case and what the recent scientific observations tell us. Okay. Okay, are we good? Is that full screen? I hope so. Uh, so here you can see Sheldon Huber saying the IPC means analysis may become useless. So let me just give you some examples. In this column is what the IPCC says, and this is what we know. So the IPC said, said we wouldn't have 1.5 to 2040. In fact, it's likely to be before 2030. They said that sea level rise this century would be less than a metre, but the US government says it could be two and a half metres. The IPCC said there was insufficient evidence of tipping points in uh, Antarctica, but we had peer reviewed papers in 2014 saying the tipping point had already been passed. And we had the IPC say, saying that the permafrost feedback, that feedback that is the release of carbon from frozen carbon stores in the Arctic, um, is not included in scenarios, but in fact, we know that they're accelerating. So this is the problem we have, that the IPCC is not up to scratch and should not be taken as a reliable basis for policy making. Now, let me explain in a very practical way what happens when you underestimate the risks. So I live in Melbourne and there's a very, there's an inner city area that used to have the Holden plant here. There's an industrial area called Fisherman's Bend. Um, it's right near the docks and it's about to be redeveloped. And the government's very excited uh, about this urban renewal project, which is gonna have 80,000 residents and 80,000 people. And the government says that this, this plan is supported by a suite of evidence-based research. So you'd think this was pretty good. Here's the problem. So they've got this plan for Fishman's Bend. Along the top here, this is the Yarra, uh, and this is the city here. And they've got all these precincts uh, for what Fishman's Bend's gonna look like. Unfortunately, if you take uh, the American government sea level rise to 2100, this is what Fishman's Bend will look like in 2100. You can see all the blue. It will be underwater. Whoops. Uh, as will be the Melbourne docks, which you can see here. Um, so this is just when you underestimate the risk, the, the disasters you get into. More interestingly, uh, the area of the old Holden factory has been uh, um, put aside for a new industrial area. And they were very excited that it was gonna be the preferred site for the new, the next generation of military vehicles being built for the Department of Defense by BAE. So here we have the federal government signing off on getting um, resources, uh, new military vehicles from a place that's likely to be underwater by 2100. So this is where climate and security issues intersect. So um, let me just go through a few things that have happened. You may have seen early this year that uh, um, last year was about 1.25 degrees. 
warmer uh, than the late 19th century. Uh, you can see it in more detail here. And you can see that these last few years are way above the trend. So three of the last five years have been greater than 1.2. The rate of water of warming is accelerating. You can see it kicking up here to a higher level. And we're going to be at 1.5 degrees in about a decade. Um, perhaps the most disturbing thing is that when we burn fossil fuels, we also um, uh, release as a, a byproduct of fossil fuels things called sulfate aerosols. Um, they're the things that come out of, of the atmosphere fairly quickly after about a week and cause acid rain. But sulfate aerosols have a really strong cooling impact and they've actually been masking some of the warming, perhaps more than half a degree of warming. So as fossil fuel uh, use declines, so does the aerosol cooling. And here's the dilemma. As we re reduce fossil fuel use, we reduce the amount of aerosol cooling. So over the next two decades, lower emissions will have little impact on the warming trend. And this is, you know, this is a disaster that most people don't know about. And you see this here where some uh, researchers said, if we reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 5% a year, how long will it take for that to be noticeably different from doing nothing? And the answer was 2044, more than 20 years. The other thing, uh, um, as I said, this will be distributed to you as a PDF, so um, don't worry about the detail too much. But the, um, the projections of warming that, uh, that have been prepared for the next IPCC report, they have high emissions, which is where we are now, central doing a lot more, and low, which is doing you know, an emergency response. You can see here that 1.5 will be um, before 2030, no matter what we do in the next 10 years. And on the, the medium and high emissions, we're going to be at two degrees by, by before 2050. So people are talking about zero 2050 are, are way behind the eight ball. The other point I think should be understood is because of that aerosol cooling, that if you take the amount of warming we've got now, which is 1.2 to 1.3, and the warming that's already in the system, we're close to, to two degrees of warming already. Um, uh, and certainly, it is wrong to say that there's a carbon budget left for two degrees from any reasonable um, low risk um, approach of, of, of a low risk of exceeding two degrees. There's simply no carbon budget left for two degrees. And I'll come back to that. Um, perhaps, and Jane Morton is very keen on this message, perhaps the most important message is that at 1.2 or 1.3, it's already too hot. When people say, you know, when's it dangerous? Our answer has got to be, it's already too hot. At 1.2 degrees, we have already passed tipping points for a number of climate systems, including coral reefs, which effectively will be dead in 10 years, uh, in the Arctic and in West Antarctica. That is, those three systems have already are in the process of flipping to a different state. Right now, there's a debate uh, among scientists about whether the Eastern Amazon rainforest is also close to tipping from being a rainforest to being a, a sclerophyll forest. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that, you know, in the next decade, the Greenland ice sheet will also reach its tipping point. So the most important thing for us to communicate is it is already too hot, climate change is already dangerous. Now, as we go on, it will become more dangerous. And, you know, the really big worry, and this is where the, the questions of collapse come in, is that if a number of future tipping points sort of gather together like a set of dominoes and fall over and simply drive the system beyond um, the human capacity to bring the warming back down. So scientists two years ago uh, produced a, a, a scenario called the hothouse earth scenario. is, And it's one in which climate system feedbacks and by that we mean for example that warming in the Arctic um, increases the ground temperature a lot of the permafrost the, the frozen carbon stores start to melt they put more CO2 in the atmosphere that creates creates more warming that is additional warming releases more permafrost and so it becomes a self-reproducing cycle uh, and what they would call a point of no return uh, whereby further warming becomes self-sustaining even if we um, uh, humans stop our emissions. So that's a really big worry. And they say that that, um, that threshold could exist at around two degrees or a bit lower. And as you saw earlier, you know, we're probably two decades or a bit more away from two degrees. So this is really close at hand. And in fact, we're currently on a um, trajectory to three or five degrees. So, you know, the, 
the, the threat is imminent and it's real and it's overwhelming and therefore dramatic emergency things have to be done. Um, the, the scientists who wrote that paper then put out a paper and I think this really summarises, these are some of the, the, the most eminent climate scientists in Europe. It was called, the paper was called Climate Tipping Points Too Risky to Bet Against and you can read it. The evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we are in a state of planetary emergency. Both the risk and the urgency of the situation are acute. If damaging cascades, those dominoes at tipping points can occur and a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this is an existential threat to civilization. Now, people who know the work we've done in Melbourne will know that, you know, for many, for more than a decade, we've been saying emergency, nobody would listen. And we've been talking about existential risk for several years and nobody will listen. And now we've, we've sort of broken through on those things and now being understood at high scientific levels. So this, I guess, is the most important picture because it's a nice little graphic summary of where we are. So a tipping point is, is a threshold beyond which large change is initiated. The most classic one is a block of ice in the freezer um, uh, is solid. As soon as you put the block of ice out on the table, it's past its tipping point. Of course, you just leave it on the table, it will melt. So the, the act of taking it out of the fridge is, is the tipping point. Uh, and, and feedbacks are the self-reinforcing loops, for example, uh, of the permafrost, where warming releases carbon, which produces more warming. Now, if we look at these, these tipping points, I've marked three in red where we've already passed, those systems are already in transition to a new state. That's the Arctic sea ice, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, which is where 80% of the Barrier Reef has already been lost, uh, and West Antarctic glaciers. As I mentioned earlier, there are another four, which I've put in orange, the Greenland ice sheet. Um, whoops, the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, you would have seen some stories in the last week about new research saying that the uh, um, Atlantic circulation, AMOC, or often called the Gulf Stream, is slowing. Uh, so Northern Europe will get, ironically, get cooler. Uh, there's the Amazon rainforest and there's West Antarctic uh, glaciers. So those systems are really in play and you know fairly critical now. And the two big ones in yellow, the really big carbon stores are the boreal forest in Canada and permafrost in uh, Eurasia, which are not critical yet, but are certainly active. So that's a story about tipping points. Um, those physical consequences then have what are called second order risks. I mean, the first order risk are the physical risks. The second order risks are the political, economic and social consequences. And one of the most astounding pieces of research came out recently. And if you look at this area, um, this is the Himalayas. Uh, the area above it is the Tibetan Plateau. Over here is the Hindu Kush. Uh, and up here is uh, Tian Xian Mountains. Uh, this is Kyrgyzstan and then Uzbekistan and so on. Um, <clears throat> the research shows that a quarter of the ice mass across these ice sheets has already been lost and, and the ice mass loss is now 1% a year. So by mid-century, more than half the ice across, across this whole area will be lost with catastrophic consequences because as you can see, all these rivers um, basically uh, get a fair bit of their, their water flow from um, um, uh, ice melt. Um, and in fact, if you um, if you go to Central Asia, um, there's a number of rivers from here go up through whoops to Uzbek Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, and they are totally reliant, 100% reliant on ice melt uh, for their water. So I mean that is going to be catastrophic. Uh, for the ability of those states to survive. Uh, another second order of risk, and of, of course the biggest one is um, uh, climate change translates into drought, less water and lower uh, crop yields. Uh, these are projections for, for just 30 years from now of um, crop yields around the world where green is a high yield and, and red is a lower yield. Uh, and in fact, you know, the quite deep red is a drop of 50%. So if you look at, at Latin America, if you look at the whole of Africa, if you look at the Middle East out through Iran, if you look at India uh, and Pakistan, if you look at most of China and all of our region, you can see that crop yields are, will fall dramatically. Uh, and that is why we are likely to, to, to find social collapse on a, you know, on a significant scale and unless we do dramatically more than we have. Um, um, in, in terms of, of 
what that looks like at three degrees um, that suggested that there will be um, it will be catastrophic for the world's poorest three billion people who mainly live in tropical areas, largely uh, in Asia. Uh, that at three degrees, water availability availability decreases sharply, um, and agriculture becomes non-viable in in the dry subtropics. So, a good example of the dry subtropics is the um, the Murray Darling Basin in Australia, where you know at three degrees is basically no irrigation water available. And that will affect two billion people worldwide. They expect that um, at three degrees, that perhaps a billion people will be displaced because regions will become unviable and or, or inundated, uh, and food production will be inadequate to meet the population. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. As we look at already, there's a decline in the crop yields, uh, a decline in the nutritional content of, of crops as it gets warmer, uh, declines in insect populations. Um, and chronic water shortages. So, you know, three degrees, which we're now on, would be catastrophic. Um, and so there's been a debate about whether we can actually say this. I mean, one of the great things about Extinction Rebellion and Roger Hallam and so on is they actually called it out. And, you know, two, two years ago and so on said, this is a climate emergency. I absolutely agree. I helped to coin that phrase. Uh, um, collapse is on the agenda and we need to be truthful about it and yeah that's been a battle and there's a lot of big NGOs who say oh that doesn't work well with the comms people we've got to be hopeful and we say no we've got to be courageous and cope, hope and courage are not the same thing so it was really um, sort of heartwarming towards, towards the end of last year when some really prominent science including Bill Stephan from Australia had a piece in the Guardian saying social collapse is on the agenda and and they said, as scientists, several hundred of them signed up, we need to talk about this. People who care about environmental and humanitarian issues should not be discouraged from discussing the risks of social disrupt or disruption or collapse. It is time to have these difficult conversations. And that's really important. And that's where XR was certainly right in saying we have to talk about this. Um, the, one of the most crucial issues is, is, the, is the Arctic. Um, uh, because that's the fastest warming place on the planet. It's warming three times the, the uh, global average. The, the sea ice, the ice which floats on the um, uh, Arctic Ocean is, is, is going really quickly. Um, we're losing ice, we're losing the reflective power of, of the ice and um, uh, a lot more heat's getting into the Arctic. Uh, Professor Raman Arthur from the US, an expert in this says, uh, stopping the Arctic melting is, any rational policy, any rational policy would make preventing further Arctic melt uh, the top priority for world leaders, the top priority for world leaders. So it was really um, heartening when recently I came across some work by a guy called uh, Professor Sir David King, who was um, the UK chief scientist for seven years and then advised an, another two conservative um, prime ministers after that, who set up a thing called the Centre for Climate Repair in Cambridge. And he says, and I think this is really worthwhile taking in, this is just off his website, already the climate, the global climate has passed the point where we can simply say if we reduce emissions, we will be fine. So he's saying reducing emissions is absolutely essential, but it's not enough. The second point he says is we have to do what we would call drawdown, removing greenhouse gases at scale from the atmosphere in order to cool the system back so it doesn't flip. So yes, emissions not enough, to carbon drawdown, and then he says, thirdly, cooling. Alongside this, we need to determine how to restore damaged climate systems, uh, particularly the Arctic and the Himalayas. That is, we've got to try and now cool the Arctic and the Himalayas so that these catastrophes, um, which I've described to you briefly, uh, don't uh, um, recur. So, I mean, in terms of policy responses, um, you know all this. Zero emissions really fast. There's a lot of talk about 2050. 2050, as you can see from what I've described already, is far too late. It is already too hot, already too hot. We are dangerously close to, to the, the hot house earth scenario. We need to do this at emergency speed. Mobilizing for 2030 is critical. Uh, 2050 won't stop outcomes. And we've just done a little um, briefing. Um, the, the link will be um, on the last page as well on why they're in fact not carbon budgets for, for 1.5 and 2 degrees and why 2050 is a really bad outcome. Um, I mean, NGOs in Australia spent the last two years campaigning for zero 2050 and now the mining companies and then the petroleum and the um, 
fossil fuel industry have all jumped on board and said, yep, they agree with zero 2050 as well, uh, which should tell you that it's a really bad <laughs> idea. Um, uh, so in some long-term targets are an excuse for pro procrastination. That's been the history of climate policy making. Um, let me just give an, a quick example of carbon budgets from, um, from, Australia, from Australia. If you take the IPCC carbon budget, which is too generous, and it's got this many tonnes of, of, of carbon left to burn. You divide it by the world population, 7.8 billion. Um, you get 150 tonnes per person in perpetuity, if it's equally shared, which is not fair. But Australia does 20 tonnes a year. So our budget runs out in seven and a half years when you divide 150 by 20. Uh, and that was from 2018. So in 2025, our carbon budget is gone. And that's the reality that nobody uh, in Australia wants to talk about. Um, as I've mentioned this to David King says, we also need to draw carbon down. If we just keep to the current level of greenhouse gases, uh, climate history tells us that we'll get to a point as we did three billion years ago where sea levels were 25 metres higher at the current level of greenhouse gases. So draw, drawing down carbon dioxide by reforestation, uh, by restoring um, ocean sinks like mangroves, uh, by rock wetting, by whatever means we can is absolutely important. And the third thing is what we can do to try and cool the system down now. Um, the idea of geoengineering or solar, solar radiation management is controversial, but I think research in these areas has to proceed because we actually need these three solutions. We can't say, oh, we have this solution, but it's not that solution. I think we need all of them. Uh, there's another proposal for mirrors. Um, there's quite a bit of work done, but we really have to put these things on the agenda. So to conclude where I started, um, I don't think the collapse of civilization is inevitable, but it will be unless we have an emergency level response. As we've seen, the human systems are fragile. Um, it's not inevitable yet, but large scale disruption is inevitable, either because we won't act fast enough and systems will just break down or because the, the scale of action they required um, is far beyond the gradualist politics that we see uh, in international policy making. I mean, we can't have smooth growth and you know non-disruption and everybody making money like they always have because that is inconsistent with what we need to do. Uh, and the, the bottom line when people say to me, what do you mean by emergency? My current definition of emergency is making climate the number one priority of climate, of economics and politics. In the sense, uh, the way we made COVID the number one priority last year. Uh, it has simply got to be at the top of the tree. So just um, in summary, the short term is crucial. What we do be between now and 2030 matters most. Talking about 2050 is useless. Um, and two slides just to, to, to finish with, because uh, when you talk about these things, people say, oh, can people bear to hear the truth? You know, won't they turn off? But if you look uh, in the preventive health area or experiences in Australia, whether it be COVID, bushfires, AIDS or smoking, honesty works. Historically, honesty has worked, including in health crises. And some of the most effective recent climate mobilisations um, have made a virtue of being honest, of calling it out like it really, like it really is, like Greta, student strike, Extinction Rebellion, and some of the local government climate emergency work worldwide. Um, uh, and then people say, but won't people become demoralised if we don't have actions that match, match the size of the threat? But we actually do have the actions uh, if we want to spend the money to, to implement them. So the final thing is, um, I don't think that the debate is about the technological solutions because they're available. We know most of them are. The most important issue is about leadership, leadership. Uh, and we know um, for us who live in Victoria, we're the Victorian Premier, despite being very bad about fishermen's bend and trying to re redevelop something that's underwater, actually showed incredible leadership on COVID. And leadership's important and leadership has two things acknowledgement rather than denial of a crisis reality, something that XR has been emphasising for a long time. And the second point, of course, is acceptance of responsibility to take action. Uh, and that means four things. Recognising that this is an emergency, that we name it as an emergency. We give other examples of this leadership and fast action. 
uh, that leadership comes from the community, not from government. And we do this by making it the first uh, priority of politics and economics. Uh, and there's the links, which I'll leave up for a moment, uh, for people who, are, who want to write them down. But as I said, Jane will share the PDF that has all this material in it. And I think that was 30 minutes, Jane, as I promised. Fantastic, a whirlwind tour of the latest science. So the opportunity now is to ask some questions. Um, I'll invite you to put them in the chat, so we'll take them in order then. And I mean, I think there certainly are sort of messaging questions and questions about tactics, um, particularly the importance of rebellion, I would say. But let's stick for the, at least for the first part, with straight science questions, because it's a special treat to have David here. Not and, really. Oh, well, I think it's a special treat. <laughs> um, to really be able to answer those thorny climate science questions. So, who has a climate science question? <laughs> but one thing I wouldn't mind hearing a bit more about is just the idea of how much is locked in now. So, how much warming is locked in the system? This is this is like so many layers of complexity. It's difficult. Um, um, obviously, we've got between you know the the trend of warming is one point two to one point three degrees of warming. Then it depends what happens from now on. If we keep on putting emissions up, obviously there's more. Um, as we know, um, in producing aerosol, in producing uh, in burning fossil fuels, we're all also producing these sulfate aerosols, which have a cooling effect which is at least half a degree and maybe more. So, I mean, people who look at things called the earth energy imbalance show that for the current level of greenhouse gases, if they stayed where they were, we'd be close to two degrees. Uh, there's another recent paper says maybe a bit more than two degrees, but the current level of greenhouse gases in the short run um, uh, around two degrees. Of course, if we stop emissions, um, some greenhouse gases like uh, methane only last 10 years in the atmosphere, and that's a significant greenhouse gas. So if we um, got mean out, methane out of um, um, rural industries, for example, um, animals and rice growing and so on, and we could get the methane uh, levels down, then that would be a bit less. Um, on the other hand, there are feedbacks um, such as the permafrost where, or the Amazon, if the Amazon goes from a rainforest, uh, the Amazon is, is dry because there is less rain in, east, in the Eastern uh, Amazon. That's partly due to climate change. It's also due to the Gulf Stream slowing. Uh, because the Amazon is drying, it's more vulnerable to fire. And when, the, and when those two processes go together and the forest burns, it's not coming back necessarily as rainforest, but as, uh, a drier forest. The same thing that will happen in Australia with, with some of the fires we've had here in the last couple of years. So there's all sorts of, of things. It's about two degrees now. It could be less if we could go to zero emissions fast, but if the if the feedbacks kick, kick in, it will be more. So it's a bit of a movable feast, I'm, mm. I'm afraid, Jane. Yeah. Does, I mean, that make, that, does that make any sense at all? That makes sense. So yeah, there was that paper, Ramanathan et al. You know, it said basically you had to get to zero at emergency speed. Yep. To draw down and do something with the short-lived pollutants, which is methane. Methane in particular. There's also another methane. thing called, called black carbon, uh, or, or oh, yes. you know, we call carbon soot, um, which particularly comes from burning fossil fuels uh, in Asia, in very poor countries where they're burned inefficiently. And when you burn cow dung, you get a lot of black soot going up in the atmosphere. Um, and that, for example, um, in the end settles on the ice in the Arctic and makes the ice darker, so it absorbs more heat. So getting rid of things like black carbon um, is, is another really useful and, and really feasible thing to do. I mean, aid agencies are just trying to, for example, um, uh, help the distribution of more efficient small um, stoves in, in peasant communities um, um, so that there's less um, black carbon going up. Okay, so having got off to a slow start, we now have got questions flooding in. Um, so uh, let me see. The first one is from Susan Locke. 
of the solutions that are available, what would be the priority actions? We've sort of been talking about that a bit, but do you want to um, elaborate? Yeah. I mean, obviously, calling the Arctic is one. Yeah. Calling the Arctic and the Himalayas. Look, I think it's a bit like somebody who's been smashed up in a car accident and, he, and, and is coming into hospital and, uh, you know, they've got several life-threatening um, problems. You've got to deal with all of them. You can't, you can't just say it's either or. I mean, mm. I mean, the reason why this is an emergency now is we have to do a lot of things in parallel. I mean, it, it's really clear, uh, for example, that reducing emissions over the next 20 years won't slow the rate of cooling. So reducing emissions is absolutely crucial in the long run, but it's not gonna have the short-term effect. So, so, so mitigation, reducing emissions to zero is, is important, but we've also got to get the level of carbon dioxide down because you know, uh, if, if we want to keep, if, if, if you want to have a barrier reef ever again, and you can cool the system, you'd have to get carbon dioxide levels down to 325. I mean, uh, before we started doing this, we're at about 280, they've gone to 415. We actually have to get them back to 325 if, mm. you, if you want there to be coral reefs around the world. So drawdown is important. And none of that will matter if the Arctic blows up and the permafrost just, you know, goes through the roof. So trying to cool the Arctic. So it's like you've got to, you know, you've got to walk, chew gum and stand on your head all at the same time. That's just, mm. that's why it's an emergency. Did you want to just, I mean, I can see a whole lot of questions now, but do you want to just <laughs> comment on what the options are for cooling the Arctic? Because I think this is one of the newer ideas, isn't it, that comes from uh, Sir David King? Yeah, that, I said that we so should and we, could, we possibly could. Yeah, so there's a there's a centre a thing you can Google. It's called the Centre for Climate Repair. It's at at Cambridge. They're at the moment are about to put a research report on the best ways to to try and cool the Arctic. I mean, there's all sorts of ideas. Um, the most the one that they think has got the best chance is called marine cloud brightening, whereby essentially if you can put uh, salt or salt water uh, into the atmosphere, you can brighten the clouds and reduce the amount of heating. So that's a fairly a fairly natural process of, of, of basically uh, trying to get salt water mist in, in into the cloud so it um, cools down. I mean, other people have, have talked obviously about um, getting rid of black carbon so that the ice is is, is more reflective. Um, there's some ideas about you know trying to whiten things. Um, uh, there's another idea. Uh, about trying to change some of the ocean circulation so the ice doesn't come out, the sea ice doesn't come out of the Arctic uh, so quickly and, and there's more reflective ice there. I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but um, um, the marine cloud brightening is also being looked at for the Barrier Reef in, in some little research program. So, you know, there, there is some established um, scientific literature on this possibility. I mean, we don't know whether any of them will work at scale, uh, but I mean, Sir David King has said to us, and I think he said publicly in the event we had here on Zoom earlier this year, he says, we've got two or three years to find a solution and two or three years to convince governments to do it. And if we don't, we might have to say goodbye to a lot of things that we like on this earth. So he thinks it's really urgent. And is that similar to like cloud seeding that they do to make it rain or a similar technology well, or not? I, I, no, cloud seeding is with different chemicals. I mean, one of the interesting things is that on the Tibetan plateau, the Chinese government has installed an industrial scale, uh, I, mean, I mean industrial scale, huge scale cloud seeding technology on the ground uh, to try and increase the amount of rain on the Tibetan plateau as a, 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 as a quid pro quo for reduced um ice melt flow off the Tibetan plateau and the Himalayas. I mean, the Chinese are geoengineering the Tibetan plateau for cloud seeding right now. Wow. Okay. And what about the mirrors? Uh, can you explain anything about the mirrors? Um, well, um, anybody who watched the, the um, lecture series we put on in February might have seen um, a guy from Harvard, I think he's called Ye Tao. Um, he's really interesting. There's a couple of videos of, of him. If you look up um, Ye Tao, Y-E is his first name, T-A-O is his second name, and the project is called Mir, M-E-E-R. Um, he's got a pretty snappy 30 or 40 minute video where he talks about um, the role of mirrors. Obviously mirrors reflect sun heat back. He said, if you can put enough mirrors down, um, you can cool the planet. And the reason why he likes it, he says, you only need two things to, to make glass. And that is a lot of sun and a lot of sand. 
And he said, we've got a lot of a lot of them in this planet. He said, it's, it doesn't require rare minerals. It doesn't require, you know, really fancy technology. Uh, he says, Australia, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, there are plenty of places where you can make mirrors without end. Um, uh, so if people are interested, Yay Tao is his yep. name, and, and M W -E R uh, um, is 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 the idea. Mirrors, I can't think of the the full name, but um, and he's got a, he's got a whole plan. It's not only about mirrors, but it's about um, um, getting more drawdown of carbon dioxide into the oceans. He's got an integrated plan. Yeah. So a bit speculative, but but crazy brave and and <laughs> yeah. crazy brave and worth because we need crazy brave solutions now. I mean, you know, and pretty low risk. Like and, 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 and that's the is, is not going to probably yeah. do any harm. No, it's it's a low risk technology, and uh, a lot of you know, I mean, there's a t team of fifty people at Harvard working on it, so it's oh. not it's not small scale idea. Okay, so moving on to some of the others, we've got one from Bron. Was the recent Texas freeze? something we can attribute to a degree of global warming? Uh, the answer is not directly, uh, but some work will be done. I mean, this is a thing called attribution studies where you try and demonstrate that a certain event would be more likely to happen because of climate change. Um, and that's being done, for example, in relation to the bleaching of the Barrier Reef, uh, which you, you remember there's been two really large bleaching events in the, in the last... Um, uh, five years, uh, and science has shown that you know a hundred years ago those bleaching events never happened, but now, um, basically the you know the corals are getting boiled by warmer water, that they're likely to happen one ev once every three years because of climate change, warming um, uh, the ocean temperature. Uh, in terms of the Texas cold, the most compelling mechanism is that um, the Arctic is, as I said, is warming much more quickly than the rest of the climate system. And traditionally, traditionally, there's a circulation system that goes around um, the Arctic um, called the jet stream, which effectively separates the Arctic weather from Northern Europe, Northern Hemisphere weather. It's sort of a bit of a, a dividing wall. And with climate change, that, that, that jet stream is destabilizing. So instead of going around, it's going up and down in big S bends. And that's having two consequences. The first is you're getting incredible heat in the Arctic. Uh, heat from the Northern Hemisphere is, you know, you're now getting these stories of, of temperatures 20 degrees warmer in the Arctic than ever before. And you're also getting extreme cold coming out of the Arctic down. Now that was part of what happened with, with, um, with Texas, that, that a huge, a huge blast of cold Arctic derived air went down there. It has happened before in Texas, so it's not a unique event. You can't say, oh, this wouldn't have happened without climate change. But I mean, one suspects that the end, in the end, they will say, well, these events will happen more frequently and will be more intense because of climate change. I mean, in the sense that um, Superstorm Sandy, uh, you know, the one that devastated New York and New Jersey um, and took out half the power system in New York was also due to jet stream destabilization. So, um, the answer is, we can't say Texas was caused by climate change, but it would be consistent with how climate change is, is affecting uh, mm. circulation systems in North America. And we could probably use that phrase, loading the dice, could we? Load, loading the dice increases yep. the probability of, is consistent yep. with. But you can't yep. say A causes B, naughty. No, no. Okay, so now we've got two on reforestation. So Susan is asking, for Australia with a reforestation action, what should we be planning for in scale? And, and Fizz is asking, is mass reforestation in Australia feasible, given the requirement of water to do so? Yeah. Now, I might turn that into a broader question about soil carbon, because I think there is, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's questions about whether actually just like grasslands, for example, as well as um, reforestation could have a role in restoring the soil um, and doing a significant amount of drawdown in Australia. But have you looked into that at all? Oh, you know, um, I know a bit about lots of things and not much about anything in particular. So I, you know, I know a, a little bit about this. Um, the question is right. I mean, growing forest from scratch requires land and water and, and a lot of resources. A woman called Kate Dooley, who's been at the University of Melbourne, has done a lot of work on this. And she says, the priority is to restore degraded forests and wetlands. I mean, one of the greatest sources of, of methane and, and um, carbon dioxide is degraded wetlands. Um, 
um, and, and degraded forests. So, um, I mean, the obvious point is before you you start um, trying to build new forests, stop the deforestation. I mean, whether it be in the Amazon or, or Sumatra, stop, stop that. Uh, and secondly, get the degraded forests and get them back to full potential because uh, restoring forests will draw down a lot of carbon. Um, so I think that, I think restoration is more important than than new forestation. Mm. Um, in terms of um, soil carbon, I mean, obviously a lot of work's been done. Um, uh, soils which have more moisture hold more carbon. There's a, there's a lot of established uh, practices and processes in um, uh, restorative agriculture, traditional processes like biochar. Uh, I mean, the, the, the question with all of this is that all these things are feasible. Um, the question is the limits. Um, um, I mean, if you restored all the forests that would be that were here in say twelve or thirteen hundred before the world really started chopping down forests, um, that would not get us back to where we were because there's all this other carbon that we've turfed out from from, from mm. fossil fuels. So, I mean, this stuff is really important, but it's not the it, 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 it's not the whole answer. Yeah, you've got to do more. Got to do more, but I mean, I mean, I mean, certainly, you know, with restorative agriculture, soils can hold a lot more carbon than they are now. Are there any other drawdown technologies that you'd like to talk to? We've got to talk about. We've got a question oh. from Janet. How much of the drawdown of existing emissions can we achieve with current strategies and technologies? Would it be enough if properly implemented? It's sort of what you've been asked answering. Oh, well, I mean, I mean, there's so many things that, that you can do. I mean, for example. There are certain sort of rocks which naturally weather, and as they weather and break down um, to dust, they absorb CO2. Uh, this is a natural process that's helped to drive the planet through climate cycles over you know, tens of millions of years. It's called rock weathering. I mean, you can enhance that process by mining these rocks and crumbling them and spreading them. Um, you can enhance the capacity of oceans to, to draw down CO2. I mean, you, you I mean, um, obviously, um, Things like algae are huge sinks for carbon dioxide. If you can promote algal growth, you can get a lot. If you can restore mangroves, you can get a lot of drawdown. I mean, there are, are um, uh, lots of possibilities. The trouble with most of these things, we're moving in the wrong direction on, on all of them at the moment. So I guess, I mean, my message is stop doing the bad things, <laughs> stop destroying mangrove forests, and then, then, yes. then go on to, to restoring them. Okay, we've got a sort of hypothetical question here from Alfred. Um, would it be possible to have a working model, computer generated and or physical, showing the real effects of climate change up till now and in the future? I guess it's, it's asking is, you know, is it also complicated that, that computer models can't even really capture this stuff? I mean, no, I say, the IPCC is not really capturing at all. Look, there, I mean, there are incredibly complex climate models. Um, and in past, they're in, in, in part, um, they're built by looking at past climate history. And some of those models are really quite good at capturing what's happened in the past. Um, so yes, there are models that reproduce uh, a lot of this. What they, there are two things that they cannot at, at, at the current time deal with. One is those what are called non-linear events, those system tipping points, mm. uh, because it's very difficult to model when the permafrost is going to go up. I mean, the IPCC, said the Antarctic ice sheet would be stable for another thousand years. Within 10 years, there's research saying it's already tipped. Yeah. You know? so, the, so it's very difficult for models to deal with non-linear tipping points. I think the more interesting issue is that physical tipping points then have social, economic and political consequences. I mean, for example, you could perhaps with fine grade models predict uh, that in the first decade of this century, there was going to be an epochal drought in, in uh, eastern Syria. Mm. I mean, it, was, it, it could be predicted that that drought would occur. What couldn't be predicted were the second order effects that in fact, that that drought in, the, in eastern Syria displaced more than a million people. You already had a million and a half refugees from the Iraq war in Syria, pushing up the, the, pro, the, the cost of food and, and, and housing in Syrian cities. And that climate event, that displacement of people due to drought in, in Syria, led to a civil war, 
with incredible consequences. I mean, oh. it almost destroyed the EU through the migration policy. So those, that, I mean, so social and economic consequences, um, uh, the humanitarian uh, consequences are at the present time are impossible to model. Yes. And that's the thing, isn't it? I think that's interesting that Rockstrom and some of the people who did the Club of Rome modelling um, are probably more pessimistic and more prone to speak out and say we're risking collapse because they've mm. modelled or attempted model at least not only sort of climate but all the other ways we're wrecking things, you know, the overfishing and, you know, the, the other various ways we're wrecking the, the systems that we depend on. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's... You can predict that it's going to get risky and you can predict it's going to get um, destabilised, but it's very hard to predict exactly when it is might it, fall it, apart. Yeah, yeah it, it's hard to, know how, it's hard to know how and where. I mean, for example, if you talk to national security people and you say, well, where's, where's the next country that might blow up? They'd say, well, Pakistan's a good, belt, a good bet. I mean, because Pakistan oh. is, a, you've got a river, the Indus River, that's largely dependent on melt off the, Himala off the Hindu Kush. So that's a big issue. You've got um, a large authoritarian government uh, where the military step in all the time. So you've got that destabilization. You've got wars on its border. It's, you know, I mean, Pakistan was interfering in Afghanistan. It's in, in a permanent war with China. Um, um, it's got nuclear weapons. Uh, it's incredibly poor. Um, it's got the world's record temperature for 54 degrees. Uh, which means it's going to go unbearably hot. So, I mean, you can pinpoint places where you think that the crisis might erupt, but, I mean, could be us, you know? Yes. All right, no, the, the pace of question asking is picking up, so I'm just trying to knock off a few reasonably quickly. Well, I'll, um, so, I'll, I'll just say yes or no. <laughs> Massive rapid movement to electric vehicles, will this help? Oh, uh, look, the, the amount of, I mean, if you're going to produce, if you're going to produce 5 billion electric vehicles for the world, uh, that's probably more rare, rare earth minerals than we've got available at the moment. I mean, everybody can't drive an electric car. So, yes, great thing, but, you know, you've got to electrify mass public transport, more important. All right, that was good. That was quick. <laughs> and someone asked, "Can we put? Can you put me on the mailing list for David Spratt's PDF?" Everyone's on the mailing list. That's quick and easy. You're all going to get it after this um, in the, in the follow-up email. So Castle asks, "In two or three degree situations, whoops, will the capacity of the Bureau of Meteorology to do seven day forecasts drop? Will we go back to three day forecasts? Does the no. weather get harder to predict as the climate destabilisation proceeds?" No, because the, the, the models at the Weather Bureau are seven-day models. It's really e easy to predict. You know, you observe what's happening, you put in the model. It's, you know, they're really good at seven days out. Um, yes. So it, well, it won't affect short-term weather forecasts. But, uh, you know, what happens in the long term is more tricky. Yes. All right, we've got a, quiz, a quiz, question from Chris. Um, would you agree it's probably time to start a process of adaptation to the effects of climate change and I know like I know we've often been annoyed by you know this idea that we can adapt when even the World Bank says that four mm. degrees might be beyond adaptation but what do you think of say more like um Jim Bendel deep adaptation like at least try and not do really dumb stuff like building um nuclear power stations or you know really other essential infrastructure where it's going to get taken over wiped out by tsunamis or sea level rise mm. You know, just some yeah. really basic things that so sort of prepare for the possibility. Like I think some things I've said is is that that we actually apparently to shut down a nuclear power station actually takes years, mm -hmm. and we're actually low on experts who know how to do that. Like so, if you take deep adaptation seriously, you know, you need to prepare in the sense for collapse. Like it's not just um, adaptation as some people think of it. Look, of course we have to adapt, um, uh, and people are adapting already. I mean. Um, the existing runway at Brisbane Airport is one metre above sea level rise. When they built a second runway a few years ago, they built it a metre higher than the first one. <laughs> so, so, so it wouldn't get inundated. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, people are not building uh, along the New South Wales coast in places where they used to. Um, local councils are saying, uh, de de declaring building on sand hills is, is not within the planning permits anymore. Um, if you look at wheat production in Australia, the area of land that is now reliable for wheat production has halved in the last 30 years. Wow. 
it's halved. Uh, some yes. years it's good. I, I mean, so we are adapting in all sorts of ways already. Uh, and and of, of, of course, I mean, uh, sea levels will rise at more than a metre this century. A half metre sea level rise will inundate 20% of Bangladesh and displace 30 million people. Mm. So you have to adapt uh, to those things. I think, and this is where the dreaded resilience word comes in, um, if all you do is adapt, you all die. If you spend all your money in adaption and none on reducing fossil fuel use, you all die. So that's what we call the adaptation trap, that you keep on adapting and not and not dealing with 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 the problem, which is the pl the pl place getting hotter and hotter, and you, you you fall through the trap door. So we've got to be aware of that adaptation trap, where um, you spend more and more time talking about adaptation and more and more money and less reducing fossil fuels, and that actually makes a problem um, uh, uh, a lot worse. I mean, the other thing I think it's worthwhile is watching, for example, the federal government use of the word resilient which lots of people like, but I mean, I've been told in Canberra that um, the word resilience is very popular with the, the current government because it says basically, you communities have to be more resilient. That is, you have to look after yourself because we're not going to. So resilience is a, is a double-edged sword. <laughs> abandonment. Just well, yes, resilience becomes abandonment. You know, we love you resilient communities. You know. uh, good luck. Good luck, yeah. <laughs> All right, no, I can see that the, the pace of questions is now gathering, it's gathering speed. So I don't know whether you, you, you're going to have a bite at this one or not. This is, I think it's related to Peter Andrews' um, sort of views on how you restore the soil carbon and restore the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, what does forest restoration mean here in Australia, e.g. does it mean removing black berries or does it mean like, a? I suppose, I think the Peter Andrews thing is just let whatever will grow, grow, you know, and that gradually as the soil repairs then you know more of the original vegetation will reappear uh, above I don't know my if you want to do that one or not <laughs> above my pay grade okay <laughs> well it's off to the side um okay but this, this is back to your pay grade has there been this is from victor has there been any projections on loss of human life given current climate change effects so i, I guess that means like in the in in you know in the 10 20 30 years that are coming up to the mid-century um, have any of those figures on how many lives might be lost? Um, it's not well quantified because for the reasons we talked before about the second order effects, I mean, um, who could predict that millions of lives would be lost in Syria because of that war? Mm -hmm. um, um, it's, you know, it, it's very hard. Um, uh, I mean, there are predictions, for example, I mentioned earlier that if you get to three degrees of warming, um, you know, which we're presently heading headed for around 2060, um, that perhaps a billion people will be displaced. A billion, one billion people will be displaced. By and, 2060. Well, at three degrees, you know. Yeah. And, um, yeah. You know, there, there are several lines of evidence that suggest that. that I mean, that's due to, to inundation um, uh, of low-lying areas. It's got to do with the, the drying of the dry subtropics, which I said is a Murray Darling, but it's also you know, that whole band across the center, center of Africa, the northern part of South America, um, you know, by three degrees, the, the Sahara will have jumped the, um, the Mediterranean and, and you get desertification in Southern Europe. So, I mean, lots of people will be displaced. I mean, how many of them die depends, I guess, on what sort of global compacts and alliances are to deal with, with mm. people who are, who are climate displaced. I mean, yes. certainly the, the current is international order is, is not well placed to, to deal with these issues. Um, um, I, I mean, you know, John Schellenhuber and a couple of other people have said that, famously said that if you got the four degrees of warming, you'd be lucky to have a billion people left on the planet and they got into trouble for saying it. Mm. But because it was a guess. I mean, there's no models for this. Um, but, no. you know, if you get the four degrees of warming, you melt all the ice on the planet and sea levels are 70 metres higher. And, you know, 70 metre sea level rise is going to take out a lot of people before anything else does, mm. let alone mm. most of the world cities. So, I mean... I don't know how much it's worthwhile speculating on how many people would die. I think it's better to talk about people who will be displaced, water shortage, two billion people suffering from acute water shortage. They're more, you know, I think they're better things to grasp hold of. 
and and also I think this this thing of just bringing it right into the next ten years about do we pass the point of no return? Because once we pass the point of no return, in a sense, it's all academic. You know whether people are displaced and survive. You know whether you know. Well, now look. I mean, I mean, people from Bangladesh, whether they, whether China welcomes the people from India. You know, like it, it's all mm-hmm. unknown. But the important thing is we have to not pass that point of no return. And and, look, and and just be really clear, we have not passed that point. I mean, the permafrost. There's a bit of you know greenhouse gases coming out of the permafrost, but the permafrost is not yet largely active. The boreal forests are not less, less active. You know, the biggest carbon stores are relatively solid at the moment. Yes. So we are we are not at the point of no return. I mean, mm. we are going to get into really dangerous territory, you know, soon with them, and that's why it's important that we do all these things. Um, but, I mean, people should not despair and think that it's too late because it ain't. Yes. In fact, sometimes we do an Extinction Rebellion introduction where we say we acknowledge that we're in a climate and ecological emergency and what we do is of great importance. So, you know, obviously what you're doing is of great importance. Absolutely. I mean, those of us listening respond is of great importance, you know. I mean, yeah, we have have agency. I mean, and the really bad thing about people who say uh, we're all fucked, there's nothing we can do about it. And, you know, I mean, there is a tendency there is it takes away people's agency. I mean, if you really think it's too late, just just go away and buy a bottle of whiskey and, you know, don't don't interview with people (laughs) who want to do something, you know. It's it's, it's dumb. I mean, if it's too late, just go away and, you know, yeah, read, 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 Tol- <laughs> read Tolstoy or whatever you want to do, but I mean, yes. it is not too late, and, and you know, we have the power and the energy, and, and we've seen that with, with Greta and XR to change this story. I mean, the story is changing. Um, governments are starting to step up, they're a long way from where they need to be, but I mean, our voices have been effective, so you know, don't, don't succumb to this we're all doomed, you know, signal, you know, prepare for the last supper. Not smart. Mm. Yes. I mean, I think one of the things that's been very encouraging is seeing that there are actually to- social tipping points as well as, as climate tipping points. Mm-hmm. Because I can remember somebody actually telling me about Greta, that there's this kid, you know, during this school strike outside the um, sw- Swedish parliament. And I went, oh, yeah, and so what? <laughs> no, no, I think this could be big. <laughs> and, and literally, I think it was only one year later or a year and a half, it went from, one, one from Greta to mm-hmm. a million kids on the street. And, and similarly with Extinction Rebellion, it went from 15 people at the start of 2018 to 70 countries in two years. Look, it happens in all sorts of places. I mean, Jane, as you know, you and I were part of a group in Melbourne, you know, more than 10 years ago, mm-hmm. who campaigned for a climate emergency and everybody said we were crazy, it would never happen. And now the UN Secretary General says it's a climate emergency and, 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 and uh, President Biden says this is an existential risk. Now, he's not following through, but, I mean, in terms of the language and the understanding of the crisis, I mean, words which were just uttered by crazies a few years ago <laughs> are now absolutely at the core of the debate. So, you know, it, you know, it is changing. Yeah, all right. We've got a couple of, you know, more sort of practical, political sort of questions. One is how to get you onto, onto Four Corners. I'm not sure. Look, um, we'll have to look, work on that. look, look, the, the, the problem is that um, um, the work that we do, you know, as I explained at the beginning, is, is to provide a compelling critique of why the IPCC international pol- and the international policy making process is broken down and is useless. And that's very hard for policymakers who are used to going to conferences and talking about zero 2050 and they hear our stuff and they just go and get drunk instead. They don't want to know. And so, you know, I mean, we have an ideological process of, of, of at, at the elite level of comprehensive denial of the seriousness of the problem. And I experience this in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I mean, I got a, an invitation a month or so ago to give a presentation to a very exclusive Washington Insiders Club because uh, they'd heard my stuff and they said they'd never heard anybody else say it. So, you know, we live in hope. That is we extraordinary. Live... That is extraordinary. We, we, that is we, really we, quite we, something, isn't it? You know, and in the last couple of years, our, our work, I mean, we put out a report at the beginning of last week or week before on carbon budgets. I got an email two days ago from somebody in Germany saying, who's an academic and running a climate centre saying, we've never heard anything like this. Can we translate this into German? And that will be done next week. So, 
I mean, you know, oh. everything, the things that we all do are, are making a difference. Well, I, I will finish with just one question on that. Um, does Biden and COP26 offer us any hope? It's from Lynn. Oh. <laughs> oh, maybe it's not. Maybe okay. it's not a downer, is it? <laughs> we, 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 you know, after after the Paris, which was a terrible outcome because we've seen six years after Paris, things have just got worse. Um, George ben, George uh, Monbiot said after Paris, compared to what could have happened, it's a miracle. Compared to what needs to happen, it's a disaster. Yeah. And I think that's probably true of the, you know, the Glasgow talks. You know, I mean, the trouble is we'll be stuck in the same zero 2050 and, you know, emissions trading schemes and, you know, net zero. And, you know, if I plant some trees, I can fly around the world forever. I mean, I don't think it's the way forward. I mean, it, 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 international climate policy making is lowest common denominator politics because 180 countries turn up and one country can veto the whole thing. I mean, oh. you don't need lowest common denominator politics now. You need highest common denominator. I mean, a deal between the EU and China on emissions would be worth more than all the cops put together. Right. And, and that's where you see the EU going. I mean, the EU are trying to push up. They've got a high ambition thing. They're about to put carbon taxes at their border. Uh, for countries like Australia exporting goods to Europe that, because we don't have a domestic carbon tax. I mean, the, I mean, a deal between EU and China, would, as I said, would be would be worth 50 Glasgow's. <laughs> oh, well. But look, one of the exciting things about Glasgow is that it's right in, in Extinction Rebellion heartland. I, I have I have some hope for it as a, well, an Extinction Rebellion event, if not a sort of international policy-making event. Well, you know, <laughs> at the moment, chaos is good. Yes, yes, and things can change fast. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting about Biden too is, you know, right. if you think how much weaker he would have been if it really hadn't been for, well, basically for Sunrise and some of those kids who did sit-ins in the in the Democrats' offices, like mm. Nancy Pelosi. Look, um, I mean, I, I mean, I think the Biden thing is really contradictory. Obviously, yeah. you know, that we're away from the Trump aberration. Um, and, and they're back on track and he's trying to do the right things. I mean, as you said, Jane, one of the reasons he's doing the right things is that the young, more progressive part of the Democratic Party around uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez said in the lead up to the election, if you want us to go out and campaign for us, you've mm. got to be strong on climate. And it was written into the platform. I mean, so they exercised raw political power inside the Democratic Party to, to push it up the agenda. And that's good. And they're saying and doing the more, uh, doing the right things, but... People say if you look at his energy team, I mean, there are a lot of senior advisors, advisors that come out of the gas industry, you know, and a whole lot more come out of Wall Street. So, you mm. know, Biden and climate is probably, you know, it's probably not better than it was, but um, it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. But the encouraging thing, I think, is how a little bit of civil disobedience, especially from passionate young people, can move things. And so, yes, I mean, David's clarified that David M has clarified that it's not just about getting you on the four corners. It's really about how to reach the public with the stuff that you're saying. And again, like, again, I think it's actually um, young kids doing civil disobedience and Extinction Rebellion. You know, I, I think if, if, we, if, if Extinction Rebellion takes on as a project, like, you know, say, look, we've gone some progress, got some progress on, on climate emergency. We've got some progress on existential threat. If, if we really focus this year on risk and collapse as the narrative um, and, you know, zero at emergency speed, um, plus all the other things that we know are needed, like drawdown and calling the Arctic. Um, yeah, somehow I think it's actually our courage in taking action that can help Absolutely. The public. I mean, I think I think the other thing that I come back to all the time is that the political elite and business are going on in a normal business as, as usual, gradualist, you know, don't upset mm. the apple cart, go along, oh, we'll put on a carbon tax, we've got a, something in 2050, this normal, safe, you know, we're growing, the society mm. stable. Political disruption is important because it's the only thing that wakes them up. Mm. And it, it, re it, re it, it really yeah. is important. I mean, whether it be an individual corporation and, and what the Galilee blockade people have been doing in, in Sydney or, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, within a year of, 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 of XR's formation in the UK, the UK passed a climate emergency bill. Never mm. would have happened before. 
Mm-hmm. Now, it's not the ant's pants, but it's really important to get in front of people's faces mm-hmm. because if we act nice and talk politely, nothing ain't nothing going to change. That's right. So that's why everyone needs to come and join us on the streets. Jane, March I'm doing, 22nd I'm, to 28th. I'm, do, I'm, doing your, autumn I'm, rebellion. I'm, I'm doing your marketing for you. You are. That's why we invited you along. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, that's, I think that's, we can't rely on the Murdoch Press to convey this message to the public. We can't really rely on the public and the politicians to convey this message to the, poli- the, to the public. Um, we've had a very interesting presentation from Scott Ludlam on state capture, which is building on the work that's been done. I just saw another advertisement in the age today from Clive Palmer still trying to push his own sort of various barrows. You know, we can't rely on the political process. And I think that's one of the good things um, that Extinction Rebellion, we don't really pretend that we can just rely on the political process. We can have another, you know, climate election and somehow everything's going to be fine. Now, I wonder just to finish whether we should ask if, if people on the call would like to sort of make some comments and I'm a bit talked out and yeah. given too many opinions, um, um, yeah. whether people just want to give any feedback or comments or All right. what saying. So, yeah, five or ten minutes of people. We, we even maybe invite you to unmute and you can talk, which is made for um, here's, here's some other different voices. Maybe the main message is just thank you. Yep. I think the main message is just thank you. So yeah, unless you've got something. Not disruptive enough. Not disruptive enough. <laughs> we can do a little extinction rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the main thing is we really want everyone out in the streets, 22nd to the 28th, camping okay. and calm guns um, and disruptive actions every day. Morning, noon and night, we're going to be doing them. Well, Thanks, everybody, for can you, uh, coming can along. Can you something? Mm. All right, my final comment. It's the Buckminster Fuller statement for a comment, David. Mm. You can, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Well, I mean, for an example, I think what Roger Hallam did was exactly that. He provided a new model of, um, of political activism, and so did Greta. I think that's exactly what we're doing. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a self-organising system where we're in an exciting extinction rebellion where we're building our new society, hopefully brick by brick. Okay, but Leah, like an absolute massive thank you to David. Um, My pleasure. For, for, for your work tonight, but just, you know, if you work more generally, because this is not a small thing, collecting all this science endlessly and then distilling it down so it fits into our less educated brains. Talking, talking is easy. Talking is easy. Doing it, doing is hard. Yes. All right. Well, pretty soon we'll be doing. And um, yeah, thanks, Hex. Thank you. Good night, everybody. See you on the streets. <laughs>